All right, so this is Dispelling the Dark Magic uh, Inside a Ruby Debugger. My name is Daniel, uh, and I watched the eclipse uh, this summer. Who, who here uh, traveled to see the total eclipse? Anyone? Okay, fair amount of hands. Um, I, I really felt like it was worth it. Uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I packed up my family. Uh, we drove a few hours down south from where we live in Seattle down to central Oregon. Uh, converged on a small town in Oregon called Madras, uh, Oregon, along with about, well, pretty much the entire West Coast, I think. Um, it was an epic traffic jam getting out of there. It was, uh, it was amazing. But the eclipse uh, was really awesome. Uh, this was a photo that I took right at the beginning of totality. Um, really surreal, uh, amazing but surreal experience. Uh, I remember looking up at this, uh, and it, it's, it's a weird feeling. It's like your body is telling you that it's not supposed to look like that, like there's something wrong, you're, 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 seeing, a, uh, you're seeing a special effect or something like that. Uh, it's just this eerie uh, experience. And I remember uh, thinking that it's, I, I'm starting to understand uh, maybe the reaction of some of our pre-scientific, pre-industrial ancestors that they might have had seeing something like this and concluding that, oh man, the world's about to end or you know, there's some sort of dark magic uh, involved here. Because looking at this, I realized that the only thing that was really keeping me from having that same reaction was the knowledge of what was going on, right? the understanding uh, of a little bit of kind of, you know, the inner workings of what it was I was seeing. And I realized that uh, as a developer, uh, I often have a similar uh, response to some of my tools. Uh, in particular, debuggers. Um, uh, I've, I've been developing professionally since uh, the late 90s or so. Uh, and throughout that career, uh, I've been very hesitant to use debuggers. Uh, pretty much that entire time. And it's because they felt kind of eerie, you know, kind of spooky. Uh, these, these tools are, are doing something bizarre to my program. They're, they're casting weird spells on, on the virtual machine. They're, they're, they're doing something that's stopping my program from running and, and causing the, the, the machine to do something else. Uh, it, it just felt eerie. Uh, I, it, it was almost intimidating. Uh, in general, it just didn't feel comfortable. I wasn't comfortable with these tools. Uh, and so I spent my entire, uh, you know, pretty much my entire career uh, as a you know, debugging, uh, troubleshooting using PUTS uh, or printf or whatever the, uh, the, the call happened to be in the, in the language that I was using. Uh, I was a PUTS debugger. -er. You know, and, and I know I, I'm, I'm not alone in that. You know, there, this was a, an article that some of you may recognize. One of our uh, uh, Ruby luminaries, member of the core team, uh, wrote this uh, early last year. Uh, put us debuggerer, you know, we call ourselves. Well, uh, it turns out that debuggers really aren't uh, as spooky as uh, they may seem at first. And to prove that, we're gonna spend this hour uh, looking under the hood at a debugger. Uh, we'll see kind of how it works, what it's doing. Uh, we'll see uh, that it's, it's, not just, it's not dark magic. Uh, it's just Ruby uh, under the hood. And it's actually not that complicated either. In fact, we're going to go ahead and just implement a uh, debugger right here. Uh, we'll feature debugger. It, it's, it's actually not that hard. Just take a few minutes. And then uh, afterwards, if we have time, we'll spend some time uh, looking at uh, a real-life uh, production debugger. Uh, some of the techniques that uh, we use to, uh, to implement it. Um, we'll look at some of the debugging facilities of the Ruby VM. Uh, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. So, uh, let's see, before I get started, a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, as I said, my name is Daniel. Uh, I've been developing since the uh, late uh, 90s or so. Uh, started with Ruby around 2005, uh, right as Rails was starting to kind of uh, enter the picture. Uh, joins uh, a kind of a series of Rails startups. Uh, then, about four and a half years ago, I decided to switch gears a bit. Uh, so I joined a, uh, a kind of a small company. Um, 
I joined, the, I joined this company. I'm part of the cloud platform team. Uh, and I work on stuff to help Ruby developers uh, use, uh, the, use the cloud platform. Uh, so it's actually been a really, uh, really good gig. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. Um, but because I work at a small company, uh, there's a little bit of small company bureaucracy that uh, I have to get through. Um, so uh, all the code that you see here, uh, sample code, live coding, uh, is copyright, the small company, and uh, Apache 2 licensed. Uh, okay, so that out of the way, let's write a debugger. Uh, we'll, what we'll do uh, is we'll just uh, create something very straightforward. Uh, we'll we'll uh, create a library that will let you set breakpoints. Uh, it will uh, let you open the command shell, debugger shell, uh, let you inspect the program state, uh, and also step through execution of your program. Uh, so kind of the basic functionality that you'll expect in a debugger. So let me go ahead and switch over to my editor here. And we'll start by taking a really quick look at a, uh, a kind of a sample uh, toy program that we'll use to demo our debugger features. Uh, so this is just a, a quick uh, program that prints out a little hello message. Um, so the, uh, the sender and the recipient of the message will be passed on the command line. Uh, sender will be set in an instance variable. Recipient gets set in a, or passed to a method. Uh, we have a method that prints out uh, uh, a hello message. Another method that prints it out twice, because why not? Uh, and that's it. So here's how that uh, actually works. Uh, read uh, read our so, hello world from RubyConf. Okay, that was fun. Let's go write a debugger. All right, so we're going to start by managing breakpoints. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, add breakpoints to a program, and we'll and we'll store breakpoints uh, in a struct. And each breakpoint will have a name, uh, and then it'll be a file and line uh, that uh, the breakpoint is in. Um, all of the uh, methods in this uh, uh, class will just make class methods just for simplicity's sake. Uh, so we'll have a method uh, to add a breakpoint. Name file line. Uh, and we'll just store all the breakpoints uh, in an array. Name file line. We'll need a uh, initialization method to initialize that uh, array. So breakpoints. Uh, and we'll make sure that that initialization gets called when we require our file. Okay, so we have a simple library that lets you add breakpoints to an array. Uh, we'll go back to our, uh, our toy program and we'll require that file. And we'll set a breakpoint. Let's see. So we'll call, give it a name, my breakpoint. Uh, we'll set the breakpoint in this file. Uh, and we'll set it over here on line 11. So, oops, let's do that. All right. So we've set a break, we have added a breakpoint to our program. Let's see what happens. And nothing happens because. We added a breakpoint to an array, but we didn't actually do anything with it, right? We, don't, we didn't actually have any code that breaks uh, at that breakpoint. So how do you do that? How do you interrupt a running Ruby program to, to implement a breakpoint? Well, one thing that you can do uh, is you can use a uh, powerful class in the Ruby core library uh, called tracepoint. Tracepoint, uh, it's part of Ruby core. It's been there since Ruby 2.0, I believe. Uh, it's a Ruby class that lets you listen uh, for events that happen at the Ruby virtual machine level. Uh, it lets you register callbacks uh, that will get called whenever those events take place. Uh, so for example, this method uh, listens for the method call event. So this, uh, this example listens for the method call event. When, whenever a method is called, it ex executes this block, which prints out a little message. Uh, Tracepoint also passes an object to the block that includes some information about the event that just happened. Uh, for example, the name of the method. A uh, number of events are supported. Uh, method calls, uh, return from methods, uh, exceptions being raised, threads starting and ending. 
Uh, there's even a, uh, uh, an event for moving to the next line in your Ruby application. And it's this event that we're going to use uh, for now to, uh, uh, to implement breakpoints. Uh, so each time we move to a new line uh, in the program, uh, we'll, we'll register this callback that searches through our breakpoints uh, and looks for, you know, do we have a breakpoint here at this line? So let's go back to our code and uh, implement that. So we'll create a, break, uh, we'll create a trace point. Uh, make sure that uh, we call this method from our initialization. I often forget that when I practice this uh, uh, thing. So trace point. Okay, we're going to trace the line event. Uh, and each time we, we move to a new line, uh, we'll search our breakpoints. Uh, we'll look for a breakpoint uh, with the same uh, file as, as where we are at, uh, and also the same line number. Uh, all right. If uh, we find a breakpoint, uh, then for now, let's uh, just print out a little message uh, that says, hey, we found a breakpoint. So breakpoint. Uh, we can provide the, uh, print out the name of the breakpoint. Uh, and again, there's a bunch of information that's available in the trace point object. For example, uh, the name of the class that we're in. Uh, there's also the, uh, the method, as we saw. Uh, let's also, just for kicks, uh, print out the, uh, uh, the file name we're at uh, and the uh, line uh, that we're in. All right, so we set up a, a line trace point that uh, when we hit a breakpoint should print this out. So let's see if that works. And there we go. So we remember we, uh, we set our breakpoint here on line 11. Uh, and looks like we hit that breakpoint. My breakpoint uh, in the method hello twice uh, on line 11. So there we go. We can, uh, uh, we can detect breakpoints. Now, once we've, we know we've hit a breakpoint, what do we do? Uh, a lot of debuggers uh, provide a little command line uh, tool, uh, kind of a command line interface that lets you uh, start interacting with the program uh, at that point. So you can uh, uh, kind of query the program, uh, see what its state is, see you know, what's, what's going on, uh, and just kind of get information about uh, how the program is operating. Uh, so if we wanted to add a command line to uh, our uh, our debugger, uh, an easy way to do that is to use IRB. Now, many of you are probably familiar with IRB as the Ruby REPL. Uh, it's, uh, you can you know, invoke it from your shell, run Ruby code on it, uh, and see what happens. Uh, but it's also a part of the Ruby standard library, and you can call it from within your Ruby program. So what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, another method on the trace point binding uh, this returns a binding object that provides a bunch of context information about uh, where you're at uh, in your program and, and what the state is. When you've required IRB, it adds a method, an IRB method to the binding object that opens an IRB shell uh, using that, uh, that binding as, as the context. So that's what we'll do. When we hit a breakpoint, we'll open an IRB shell. So let's try that. We'll look back at our program. And we hit the breakpoint, and we've got an IRB shell. All right, now here's, here's where things get interesting. We've got an IRB shell open uh, with uh, the current context here on line 11. Uh, what's, what's going on here? Well, we have uh, a, a local variable recipient that's in scope. So we can look at its, uh, its value, and we can see that it's world, right? Uh, we're in the context of an object. Uh, we have access to the member variables, such as sender. Uh, so we can see its value. We, since we're in the context of this object, we can call methods. Let's try calling hello. And we can see uh, what it does. Uh, we can even change the, the values of things. You can change the state of the program. Uh, so we have uh, the recipient uh, local variable. Let's change its value to, say, New Orleans. 
Uh, let's change the sender also to uh, Ruby community, say. So we can change the state of the program. And now when we continue uh, execution of the program by just exiting uh, out of our B shell, uh, the program will continue with that, uh, that changed state. Uh, so now we've got uh, a, new, uh, a new output for the program. So that's pretty much it. You know, that's, that's the basics of, uh, of a debugger. Uh, real production debuggers will often include additional features uh, on top of this. Uh, since we have some time, let's try implementing a few of those. Um, so we noticed that so we, we continued program execution using IRB's exit command to just exit the IRB shell. Normally, a Ruby pro, uh, or a, a debugger shell will use a, a command like continue, uh, or since continue is a reserved word, maybe cont, uh, to continue execution of the program. So if we wanted to, to offer that uh, as a command, um, that is, uh, add a command to IRB, uh, the easiest way to do that is to add methods to a particular module, uh, IRB extend command bundle. Uh, any methods uh, present in this module get uh, added to IRB as, as a command. So let's create a command called cont. Uh, we'll use, we'll, we'll uh, defer the uh, implementation of this back to our mini debug module. And we'll pass in uh, an object called IRB context. This is, uh, this is an object that's available to IRB commands and it uh, lets you uh, interact with the IRB session. Uh, so if we go back to uh, mini debug and we implement this, cons pass in IRB context. Uh, and again, to continue the program, uh, we just have to exit the IRB shell. So we'll do that, IRB context.exit. Now, when we go back into our debugger, we should be able to use the cons commands to continue the program. And there we go. Okay, what else can we do? Uh, let's implement stepping. So stepping uh, means we, uh, so if in, our, in our example, we've, uh, we, we break at line 11. Uh, stepping means that you can uh, execute one line of your program and then go back into your shell so you can see what effect that line had. Uh, and you know, re can do this repeatedly, so you can kind of step by step, line by line, go through your program and you know, see how its state evolves over, over, you know, over time. Uh, so, to implement kind of a line-by-line -line, uh, process, uh, well, we already have something that uh, lets us do something line-by-line. -line. That's our trace point here. Uh, so, let's modify this uh, to implement stepping. Uh, instead of opening our IRB shell when, just when we hit a breakpoint, uh, we'll also open that shell if we're kind of in a stepping mode. Uh, so let's create a kind of a stepping mode, and we'll initialize it here in our initialization, stepping uh, to false. When we hit a breakpoint, we can set it to true. And then as long as we're stepping, uh, that's when we will open our, our uh, debugger shell. Now continue means uh, you want to continue your program and stop stepping. So let's turn it off here. Okay, so we've got a stepping mode here. Uh, how do we actually implement step? Well, first we need to uh, create a uh, IRB command for it. So we'll do that, step. Uh, and then we'll implement it. Uh, like cont, like continuing the program, stepping uh, just involves uh, exiting out of IRB. But unlike continue, uh, stepping uh, doesn't turn stepping mode off. Uh, so we leave it on uh, so that the next time we hit our line trace point, we'll go back and, and, uh, and open the debugger shell again. So that's stepping. Uh, let's try that out. Uh, we'll go back and look at our program. Again, uh, we are breaking on line 11. So there it is. Now if we step, and uh, we've executed a line, and now we're on line seven, which is here. So see what happened here. Uh, we were on line 11. 
we executed one line, and that was a call to the, the, the hello method. So the next line that gets executed here is, is here, line seven. Uh, again, if we step again, now we're on line 12. So we're, we were here, we exited the hello method, uh, and we're back here on line 12. Okay, and, if, and again, if we can't, uh, then the, the, the rest of the program will run. And notice what happened here. We, when, when we stepped that first time, we went into the implementation of this hello method. Uh, that's called a step in. Uh, you're stepping into uh, the implementation of something that you're calling. Uh, so sometimes that's, uh, that's a useful thing to, to have. Uh, other times you'll want to use a variation uh, on this called step over. Uh, step over means that uh, uh, if you make a, uh, a method call, you'll step over uh, the, the call to that method. So you won't break in the implementation of that, but you'll break uh, on the next line of the method that you're currently in. Uh, so for example, uh, from line 11, step in puts you on line seven. Step over will step over this hello call and put you on line 12. So how would we implement this? We need to keep track of methods. We need to keep track of method calls and method returns so that we know when we're back on our original method, right? Well, we have a way to keep track of things like that, method calls and method returns. Again, trace point. So we'll go back here and uh, try implementing step over. Uh, and the way we'll do that is we'll just uh, keep track of our current stack depth uh, and we'll, uh, uh, and every time we hit a method call or a method return, we'll modify that. So we'll uh, initialize it uh, at zero, and then we'll create uh, another set of trace points. Uh, depth trace points. Uh, once again, we'll make sure that this gets called when we initialize. So this time we're gonna trace the call event uh, and we'll also trace B call. Uh, B call is a, a call event for blocks, which for our purposes are kind of like methods. So each time we get one of those events, we will increment our depth. Uh, and then similarly, when we return from uh, a method or from a block, uh, we'll decrement our depth, okay? So that will keep track of our stack depth. Now we, now we know uh, at any point in our program what, you know, how, how, many, how deep we are in method calls. So to implement step over, uh, let's go ahead and uh, rename this so that we know what we're doing. Step over. So to implement step over, we just have to keep, tr uh, kind of record where we are, what our stack depth currently is uh, so that uh, when we uh, go and look at, so should, we, should we open the, the, uh, the shell again? Uh, you know, are, we, are we at that same method? So what we'll do is we'll kind of record this uh, target, setting target depth. Uh, we'll make sure that we initialize that also when we set up, when we first hit our breakpoint. And then uh, it's only when we're back at that target depth that we uh, open our uh, our debugger shell. All right, so let's try that out. I hope I did that right. So again, we broke on line 11, step over, and there we go, we're on line 12, okay? So that's step over. Uh, we saw step in, there's also step out, uh, meaning that uh, uh, you don't break out into your debugger shell again until you've left the current method, so you're one uh, level, one stack depth uh, above where you started. Um, so as you can imagine, you can use that same uh, mechanism uh, to implement step out. Uh, I won't do that here for time, uh, but uh, you know, it, it should be pretty straightforward once we have uh, uh, have a way to kind of track our stack depth. So that's pretty much it. Uh, we have uh, a debugger. Uh, we can set breakpoints. Uh, we have a command shell that's, uh, where we, that we can use to uh, look at uh, current program states, uh, change things, see, how, see what effect that has. We can step through the uh, execution of our program. Um, you know, this is a debugger that's usable. And so, uh, let's see what it looks like. It's just about uh, 60 lines of code or so. Uh, so it's not that hard, not that hard. 
Uh, so let's see, since we have a little bit of time, let's go a little bit deeper. Um, my team at my small company, uh, among other things, we implemented uh, the Ruby version of a product that we have called Stackdriver, uh, Stackdriver Debugger. Uh, this is a debugger that operates a little bit differently from the one that we just implemented here. Uh, it's designed for web applications, live web applications, where uh, you actually might have a user on the other end that's waiting for a, a response. So you can't set a breakpoint and then just inter an interactive shell because that kind of stops your program and you have a user waiting for a response. You also have to be careful uh, about what you do uh, because uh, you know, if, you, if you have a, a real user, uh, you don't want to break things uh, you know, for, for that user. Uh, so, but it would still be really cool uh, if you can still set breakpoints uh, if you can still you know, interrogate the, the program states and just kind of see what's going on, see, you know, look at the behavior of your program, uh, all without redeploying. So that's what Stackdriver Debugger is designed for. Uh, it's, Google actually has been running an internal version of this tool for some time. Uh, we just uh, fairly recently released uh, a version of it for, for the cloud platform, so cloud customers can use it now. Um, but as a production caliber debugger, um, uh, it employs, uh, and it's a little bit different, so it employs some, uh, a few different techniques and some more advanced techniques. Uh, I'll go through some of those so that you can see uh, some of the, the other things that debuggers can do. So first, threads. Um, typically in a Ruby web app, uh, you might have multiple threads running, right? Each thread might be running uh, a separate request. And so when you're in a debugging session, uh, you often want to limit your analysis to uh, one thread, one particular request that you're uh, you know, interested in. Uh, you don't want other requests to interfere with that. You don't want to interfere with other requests. And so in particular, uh, if you set a trace point, uh, you want that trace point to be scoped to just one thread. Now, unfortunately, uh, the Ruby trace point API applies globally. It applies to all threads uh, at once. Um, and so we kind of have to drop down to C. Uh, there is a C API for trace points uh, that does uh, happen to support thread scoped trace points. Uh, so uh, there's no way yet to, to access it from pure Ruby. Uh, so you have to write a C extension for this. Uh, so that's what uh, Stackdriver's uh, Ruby debugger does. Uh, all, uh, pretty much uh, all or most of our, our trace points are thread scoped uh, using this technique. Um, in general, this is one of a number of kind of advanced Ruby features, Ruby VM features, that uh, are exposed in C, uh, but not yet in Ruby. Um, given how useful this particular one is for debuggers, uh, you know, it might be something that we should consider uh, maybe exposing this one to Ruby, uh, at the Ruby API level. Second, speed. Uh, in the mini debugger that we built, we used a line trace uh, to, to detect breakpoints. Now, this means that we're executing extra Ruby code for every line of code in our program, right? Uh, of course, this can be slow. This can uh, be a, a major performance, uh, performance hit, and I'm sure some of you are probably thinking that uh, as, we, uh, uh, as we implemented this. Um, so, we don't want to hurt performance uh, of, our of a, a user application uh, in a live debugger like this. Uh, so we put in a lot of optimizations uh, into Stackdriver Debugger to, uh, just to make sure that uh, the impact on performance is minimal. Uh, one example, since line tracing is uh, very slow, uh, you know, it, it just fires for every line, uh, we actually selectively turn it on and off based on how close we are to, uh, to a breakpoint. Uh, so for example, uh, we can do this by using other trace points. Uh, this is kind of a simplified example of what this kind of technique could look like. Uh, you can listen to uh, certain events that uh, could indicate that you're moving from one file to another or from one method to another, uh, and then trigger off that to check, okay, am I close to a breakpoint now? Is there a breakpoint in this, fo in this file or in this method? Uh, if so, then you turn on your line tracer. Uh, so this is a bit of a hack. 
Um, in an ideal world, we'd really love to have uh, native breakpoint support uh, in the VM, in the Ruby VM. Right? Uh, and it turns out that we actually kind of do, sort of. Um, but it's a little trickier than, uh, than it sounds. Uh, different debuggers have uh, different needs, and Stackdriver debugger is a little bit unique. Uh, so, for example, Ruby actually has an experimental C API uh, called line trace specify, uh, and it's meant for this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of debugger that has line-based uh, breakpoints. Uh, but Stackdriver, the way, that, the way that we want to manage our breakpoints didn't quite work for us, and so uh, we actually had to fall back to, uh, to line trace points uh, for, uh, for our implementation. Uh, overall, uh, how to design a good uh, API for breakpoints and for debugging in general uh, is difficult because you have a number of uh, different use cases, a number of different kinds of uh, things that debuggers might want to do. Uh, we at Google have started thinking about this, you know, how to do this for, for Ruby, and I'm sure the Ruby core team has been working on this for quite some time as well. Uh, so I hope that uh, working together, we can start uh, you know, coming up with you know, how this should really look. Uh, side effects. Stackdriver debugger, again, it's designed to run on live web applications. Uh, uh, in such a case, uh, it's very important that you avoid changing things. You avoid uh, changing the behavior or the state of the program. Um, so the, the, the developer operating the debugger uh, should be able to observe things that are going on uh, in their program, but not modify anything, not change things that could break a user. Um, so to help developers protect against this, uh, we actually wrote uh, a side effect detector, uh, and, and uh, that's part of the debugger. Uh, it's not perfect, uh, it's, it's conservative, uh, but you might find it interesting how it works. Um, side effects uh, in Ruby uh, tend to fall into two categories. Uh, first, there is object changes. Uh, so you have things like uh, the changes to the value of an instance variable, for example. Uh, you also have external side effects. So things like you, you, you set some data in a database or you uh, uh, sent some bytes on a network connection. Uh, we can detect these side effects by actually looking for these kinds of operations at the bytecode level. Uh, so we built a bytecode analyzer. Uh, whenever we run Ruby code at a breakpoint, uh, we compile and we analyze the bytecode implementation. And then if we encounter any state-changing bytecodes, such as set instance variable, uh, we, we throw an exception rather than actually running that code. C methods are another uh, common, uh, common source of side effects. Uh, it's really difficult to analyze the behavior of a compiled C method. Uh, so what we do is we whitelist C methods that we know uh, to, be, to be safe, and then we just prevent all others. Uh, so again, it's conservative. Now, preventing side effects, this is kind of, seems kind of esoteric, you know, it's a little bit of a bizarre use case. Actually, it's, it's conceptually really simple what we're doing. Uh, what we're really talking about here is immutability, right? Immutability for Ruby. Now, some of the other, I've, I've been to some of the other talks, uh, and several people have been talking about immutability, uh, often in the context of functional languages. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's very common uh, part of the functional paradigm. So languages like Haskell, Elixir, uh, use it. And it provides you know, things like performance gains, uh, safer code, code that's easier to reason about. Um, immutability makes uh, a little bit less sense for an object-oriented language like Ruby. Um, but uh, for our debugger, we do have a use case for it. Um, either something st like straight out immutability or maybe something else similar, like maybe we could have some kind of code jail that uh, uh, prevents one piece of code from modifying the state or resources owned by another piece of code, which, you know, come to think about it, sounds suspiciously like guilds, maybe, kind of, sort of. So anyway, just some additional use cases to think about uh, as we think about the, uh, uh, the future evolution of our language. So we've gotten pretty deep here. Uh, let's come back and recap a little bit of what we've seen. Uh, again, at the basic level, debuggers are quite straightforward, actually. Uh, you set a breakpoint, 
and then you can observe what's going on, and for some debuggers, you can change things. Uh, you can step through the execution uh, and see what's, uh, what's going on, how things evolve over time. We implemented uh, a simple but full-featured Ruby debugger right here. Uh, it's, we did it from scratch, it's not that hard. Then uh, we talked about a real debugger, a stack driver debugger. Uh, we talked about some of the techniques that we used to implement it, uh, some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, we saw that Ruby itself uh, has support for some uh, debugging capabilities, uh, some useful APIs that can be used by debuggers, um, but there are some things that maybe could be added or changed to make things uh, better, you know, faster or safer. Now, if you'd like to experiment with a debugger yourself, uh, here are a couple of uh, suggestions. Uh, Bybug may be familiar to a lot of you already. Uh, Rails brings in by default. Uh, it's a traditional shell-based debugger, uh, it's, so it's good for Ruby command line tools, uh, applications like that. Um, for the web application case, uh, you can try a tool like Stackdriver Debugger. Uh, these are both open source on GitHub, so you can kind of look at the source, uh, see what's, what's going on, how things work. Uh, in both cases, the core of these debuggers uh, are exactly the same as what, uh, what we just implemented. They're based on trace points. So now that we've seen a bit about uh, what's going on under the hood, I hope that uh, you know, interacting with the debugger maybe just feels a little less intimidating. You know, it's not rocket science, it's not dark magic, it's, it's just Ruby. So thank you for coming, hope you learned something. I don't know if we have time. We probably have just a couple minutes for questions, if there are any. Okay, so the, the question is, um, in fact, let's uh, go back and look at that. Uh, in our example program, uh, when we stepped, we, we stepped into the hello method, right? And, uh, and then when we stepped again, we kind of stepped over this puts method and, and exit hello method. So why, why, why didn't it step into puts? Is that, right? Uh, puts is actually, as I understand it, a C method. Um, so, uh, you actually need to use a different trace point. There's a C call trace point uh, that, that will detect that rather than, uh, rather than line trace points. And then, of course, since it's a C method, it's hard to you know, debug that using a Ruby debugger, so we didn't do that. Yes. Anything else? It's really hard for me to see, so shouts if you're... Okay, I think that's it then. Thank you. Thank you.